one virtual season ends, another virtual season begins. And Blacarly, well, just wins, apparently. I'm David Hood of the Diplomacy Broadcast Network, and this is Deadline, DBN's monthly news program. Dateline, March 2024. For our feature story, in March 2020, the world changed forever as the COVID pandemic resulted in a lockdown, which in most communities largely stopped all activities involving human interaction. The world of diplomacy changed forever as well, due to the well-known doctrine that necessity is the mother of all invention. Faced with the inability to play our game face-to-face, -face, the new uh, genre of virtual face-to-face -face diplomacy was born. Similarly, faced with lots of time on our hands, but no lesser wish to organize and promote the hobby, the Diplomacy Broadcast Network itself was born. And importantly, the concept of the DBN Invitational was developed, an end-of-season hyped and televised event pitting 28 top players against each other in a virtual tournament designed to tie together all corners of the diplomacy world to create an overall season champion. This Calhammer Cup was first held in February 2021 with Australian Peter McNamara taking that title. And now three years later, he's done it again. We'll talk directly to this two-time champ later in this program. But first, a look at headlines from around the world of diplomacy. As I just mentioned, the DBNI top board finished play the last Saturday of February, featuring a top board which included, in addition to McNamara, Christopher Ward and Saren Kwok of the UK, with Saren playing actually from Morocco, and then Americans Matthew Tatanchi, Johnny Gillum, Ed Sullivan, and Doug Malott, with Doug actually playing from Mexico. This Super 7 game was a one for the ages with Peter's Austria winning the tiebreaker against Ward's Germany to take the crown, both being at eight centers when the draw passed. Three other players tied at six centers. There are very good articles from each of Ward and McNamara in a recent issue of the Diplomacy Briefing, and I've linked it below. And of course, you can watch my interview with the winner in just a few minutes right here on this very program. Kudos to Brian Pravel, Kevin O'Kelly, and the rest of the DBN production team for an outstanding tournament. And if you did not catch the live coverage, that is also linked below. In face-to-face -to -face tournament news, the 2024 Melbourne Open was played the first weekend of March in, of course, Melbourne, in this case, Victoria in Australia, under the capable leadership of hobby legend and DBN personality, Andrew Goff. Surprising precisely no one, Jamal Blacarley from Canberra took first place in the event adding this victory to his current world champion status in face-to-face -face diplomacy as winner of the 2023 World Dipcon in Bangkok and in virtual play as the 2023 winner of the Virtual Diplomacy Championship. California player Karthik Conniff made his debut in Australian face-to-face -face play by coming in second, with Diplomacy Game podcast co-host Ken Gordon of Brisbane taking the third position. DBN recently released full coverage of that event's games, which is linked below. Now, in other face-to-face -face news, Diplomacy returned to the PrezCon Gaming Convention in Charlottesville, Virginia, the last weekend of February, with past guest and friend of the show, Claude Worrell, winning that event on his home turf. Johnny Avina won the silver at PrezCon this year with Jeff Heyman taking the bronze. Now, as far as upcoming events go, Whipping in San Francisco should be happening about the same time you see this broadcast. But in mid-April, we'll see a new tournament, this one being in Canberra, Australia. It's called the Hung Parliament Handicap. And then the end of May, will bring back the long-running DixieCon in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The weekend after that, we have World DipCon taking place in Milan. Links to all of these face-to-face -face events can be found below. Many times here on Deadline, I have reported to you about mentions of our game which have appeared in various media outside of the diplomacy hobby itself. In a recent post on the website Dicebreaker, contributor Philip Harker wrote a piece discussing how diplomacy was a literal game changer in the overall board gaming hobby when it appeared 70 years ago in 1954. He describes the fairly simple mechanics of the game marveling over its decades-long staying power as stemming from a combination of its easy-to-learn rules with its endless possibilities of gameplay that are inherent 
in the unfiltered and free-flowing negotiations between the players in diplomacy. Harker suggests that modern gamers are missing out by not playing this classic game more often to experience the thrill of not as much playing with the pieces of the game, but playing the other players themselves. I cannot recommend this article highly enough. Check it out using the link provided in the show notes. Virtual diplomacy leagues in the English language are back on the menu here in March, with the first leg of the Tour of Britain having been played on March 8th, I'm sorry, March 9th, using the VWDC Discord server. I won't spoil the results in case we showcase those games on a future edition of League Night here on DBN, but I will tell you that GBM, GM Gary Sturley has announced the next round of the tour will take place on Sunday, April 21st, starting at 4 p.m. local UK time, which is 11 a.m. Eastern time for those in North America. Virtual face-to-face -face as a medium of play involves a live game played on Backstabber with negotiations taking place on Discord. If you have not tried this yet, you should. Another opportunity you have to begin virtual league play is the new season of the VDL, the Virtual Diplomacy League, which has its first game day on March 30th. The rounds to begin on U, at, at 0700 UTC, 1400 UTC, and 2100 UTC time zones. Coverage of these games will happen right here on DBN's YouTube and Twitch channels that evening, that same evening, with the debut of the 24th edition of our program, League Night. Join the fun of the VDL and or the Tour of Britain by joining the VWDC Discord server and then finding those roles within that server using the link I have provided below. Every month, we like to report on the latest and greatest audio, video, or visual content from creators we call our DBN media partners. Brother Board's Diplomacy Dojo channel dropped a recent podcast episode about negotiation theory called Being Charming and Likable, and it featured DBN personality Tommy Anderson. This audio recording of a past masterclass from the virtual world diplomacy community involves a short presentation from multiple tournament, tournament winner Anderson about his negotiation style. And then it includes a question and answer session spanning a number of topics related to relationship building, relationship repair after there's stabbing, and also other subjects as well. From the world of print media then, the March 8th edition of the weekly newsletter called The Diplomacy Briefing featured a pair of articles about a recently concluded DBNI top board, again from winner Peter McNamara and then from Christopher Ward. But then the next week, we had a piece from Ed Sullivan, that's the March 15th briefing, about the same game in which he gives you a totally different perspective. Now, who knows? You too could reach the highest point of diplomacy climbing in the end of 2024 season and get to that DB&I. So do your prep work now by checking out these two issues of the briefing and reading those three articles using the links below in the show notes. As regular viewers of this show know, I do like to keep everyone informed of the current status of the diplomacy zines, which at one time formed the backbone of our hobby, but which now mostly constitute a window on diplomacy's past. One of the newest zines on the scene is Stephen Agar's God Save the Zine, which continues to chug along with interesting pieces on British hobby history, strategy articles, and the running of diplomacy and variants of diplomacy in addition to other games. A gunboat game for the diplomacy variant Hoplite Wars is just about to start in the next issue of this zine, and he has openings in other games available as well, so check that out. I've got a link to his zine website provided below. And then Chris Hassler's zine called SOB is from California. It turns, turns out extended deadline versions of multiple board games, including one of the earliest commercially published diplomacy variants the one called Machiavelli. SOB has always run Machiavelli as part of its games menu. It also boasts an invaluable list of active diplomacy zines from all over the world, and it, including those from various uh, continents and countries. He's also got a list of a couple of zines that are running down to a fold. And let me explain maybe to those who have never heard that term. In the zine culture, that's when you have a zine that's lasted a long time and you've decided to close it, but you're going to finish out the games. In this case, we have two 
very important zines in the to hobby history, Doug Kent's Eternal Sunshine and Jim Reader's Variable Pig, which are both running down to a fold. But other zines on the list are still going strong, some after many decades of publication. You can follow the links below to check out how the diplomacy hobby used to operate and still does in a limited fashion. Does diplomacy content still exist on Facebook? The answer is actually it does, particularly for hobbies outside of North America. One good example is the London Diplomacy Club, which organizes its face-to-face -face games on its Facebook group page, along with publishing other content about games played elsewhere. By the time you see this broadcast, the London Diplomacy Club, uh, ga Club's game day on March 16 will have already taken place, but if you live anywhere near London or will be there in April, check out the Facebook page to see about their April game day and see if you can join in the fun. Another active Facebook group is for Australians, which had a number of posts surrounding the recently completed Melbourne Open and has also had some posts about the upcoming Hung Parliament Handicap. And then finally, the European Hobby has a relatively active Facebook page, which includes photographs, historical bits from the past, as well as promotional posts about the upcoming World Dipcon in Milan. I have included links for all of these Facebook pages below in the show notes. Now, before we get to the far feature story, I want to check in on the progress of a variant diplomacy event called the Tournament Through Time, run by longtime North Carolina variant designer and GM, Alex Ronka. Alex, welcome back to the show. Hi. Tell us a little bit about your diplomacy background, first of all. Oh, yeah. So I received uh, the board game diplomacy as a gift uh, back in college many years back um, and started playing a little bit during that period, uh, but really kind of got back into it in the late 2000s um, with some friends from work. And from there, just kind of later got into variant design and GMing and uh, attending at least some face-to-face uh, -face tournaments, mainly DixieCon. Um. Well, uh, that's a totally legitimate answer. I know you <laughs> spent a lot of time also on play diplomacy, including as a moderator. So tell us I a little did. bit about yeah. that. Yeah, I, I had a I had a brief stint as kind of an admin there. It didn't really it, it wasn't something I could keep up with, but um, I am proud of the work that I did toward getting two variants implemented there uh we we did an implementation of 100 uh the 100 years war variant with three players as well as um a kind of re-implementation of a an older variant called war in the americas which is a 10 player variant across both of the american continents so uh, i'm really proud of the artwork and the the kind of technical aspects there um but a lot of what i was doing was forum based and now those forums are gone so <laughs> yeah play diplomacy has really hit a rough patch well you are a well-known variant designer we just talked about variants and we and, and we've actually played at least one of your variants at dixicon why variants um i personally just really enjoy the kind of creative angle that it gives me the um it's almost like a diplomacy can be seen as a game unto itself, which is absolutely valid, but it can also be seen as sort of a toolbox um, in a way similar to how Dungeons and Dragons can be a game by itself, but it can also be this platform upon which people who want to create something more can build upon. Um, and whether that's new maps or amended rules or some combination of the two, um, there's just a lot of opportunity to make other scenarios uh, and it's it's been a really great creative outlet for me. Well, and I think people have appreciated what you've done in that regard. So let's move on to the tournament through time, which is all about yes. variants. Just describe it for us, if you would. Right. So this is the second time I've run this tournament. Um, the first time had a very different structure, but it was run through the Play Diplomacy forums um, back in 2018. And I've been wanting to bring it back. So this year uh, it is structured so that we're having four rounds total in the calendar year. Uh, each round lasts about two and a half months of real time. Um, the pace is a little bit slower, so it's about it's a max of seven game years per uh, round, which is a little short, but it's, it's just necessary to keep everything moving. Um, 
each round for the first three rounds will have three tables each. Um, and the variants all in those three rounds are all 10 player variants. Um, the final round, uh, which will be in the last quarter of the year, will be a top table and it will be a variant, uh, a nine player variant. Um, so the top nine will compete for the, the top spot in the tournament. Uh, and like as most top tables work, whoever does the best in that particular round will win the whole tournament regardless of scoring before. So um, I'm really excited to run it this way. Uh, having a top table w isn't always the best thing for certain contexts, but here, uh, based on experience from last time, I really want to make sure that the last game feels really relevant, that it doesn't seem like a done deal that someone's going to win unless some crazy thing happens. I, I want it to feel like everybody could have a shot in that final round, and I, I think that's going to achieve that. Oh, good. All right, well, let's talk about the variant games themselves, if you want to. Yes. So all four variants have a common rule structure, which uses what's called uh, Diplomacy Points, or DP, wherein you have all these little neutrals all over the map. And there can be different rules for different types of neutrals sometimes. But these neutral armies and fleets uh, cannot leave their starting position, but they can perform a number of orders along the way. And their orders are decided through sort of secret bids uh, that are placed by all the different players who are on the board. And so they spend their DP, their diplomacy points, to say, I want Brazzaville to do this, or I want... Um, Freetown to do this. And so it adds a lot of kind of character to the game. It adds a sort of NPC element um, for those of you who might be familiar with video games or um, tabletop role-playing games. So this specific variant, this was the first round we just finished. This is Sub-Saharan. It is, uh, I chose to do a map of Africa that excluded the northern part of Africa because I wanted to cover a period in Africa's history where colonialism had just started. Um, but hadn't like completely taken over just yet. And so this 1881 time period is slightly before the Belgian conquest of the Congo. And so even though Algeria and Egypt were pretty much fully integrated into the French and Ottoman empires at that point, um, sort of the sub-Saharan portion of Africa had some colonies along the coast, but had not been kind of completely overrun by Europeans. And so you have these 10 players here, uh, in various kind of, some of them are colonial positions, some of them are indigenous positions, um, and some of them are, it's a kind of Islamic uh, uh, revolutionary groups uh, to a certain extent, like the Mahdists. So, and then you have like Ethiopia, which is a very old empire. So mm -hmm. um, I thought it brought a lot of kind of flavor and I really wanted to, I really wanted to tackle an Africa map because it's kind of a difficult geography to make interesting from a diplomacy perspective because so much of diplomacy has to do with the difficult push and pull of fleets and armies. And so you'll actually see some of that a little bit with the, the ending positions of the games. We had one game with hardly any fleets. We had some games where the fleets were completely vital, etc. Um, so yeah, that's the first round. All right. You want to go to the second one? Sure. It's a succession and legacy. Yeah, there we go. So Succession and Legacy, as you can see, takes place in Europe. This is targeted around 1703. Um, there are, at that point in history, there were kind of three wars all going on at once in Europe. You had the War of Spanish Succession. So you can see there's kind of this division of neutrals in Spain between those allied to the, the French and those allied to the Habsburgs in yellow. Um, there was the Great Northern War between Sweden and Russia. And there was also a civil war within the Habsburg Empire. Um, and I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, but it's Rakhchosi's um, rebellion or, or, or whatnot. Or, or they were the, there was the Hungarians, right? The Hungarians. Yeah, yeah. As a, the, the Hungarian, he was sort of Hungarian Transylvanian uh, noble who got a lot of other kind of rural nobles to put together an uprising against the Habsburgs. And so um, it makes for an interesting kind of setup where you've got what was what would have been traditionally Austria broken in half. Um, so, you know, at that point in history, the Habsburgs had a huge empire. And so like for diplomacy balance purposes, that's not always the greatest, but putting it in the middle of the civil war kind of is a nice opportunity to break that up. Um, England was not quite the superpower that it would become. Uh, it, and uh, you had Sweden that was somewhat of a superpower, which is kind of an interesting moment in history. Um, so this again uses the DP system. We'll be starting this round 
uh, April 2nd with placement announcements. All right, let's move on then to the um, to the third variant involved here. Yeah, so Order of the Dragon, uh, set in the 15th century. This takes the DP system and adds another level to it. So you won't see a ton of this on the, the starting map here, but uh, there's an extra element uh, regarding marriages and creation of new powers as you go along. So it's a little more advanced rule set, but it lets pairs of players create kind of new micro powers on the map that then they share jointly, which can be interesting because they still have to bid secretly on these uh, orders for these new powers. And so depending on who has the more influence, uh, one of the two parent powers uh, might cause the child power to destroy the other parent. So you have some really interesting mechanics going on with that. There's also kind of early knockout mechanism where these little kind of quasi units called heirs um, that live either in your capital or in the kind of powers that you spring up elsewhere, if all of those heirs get killed and your capital's gone, then your power is done, even if you have more SCs on the map. And that, uh, the last time we played this, uh, <laughs> one of the largest powers on the board um, made some pretty serious mistakes and actually killed off one of his own heirs thinking he'd be okay the same turn that all of his other heirs died. And so we had a, we had a stretch of something like maybe 10 different SCs that all had to be converted back into neutrals. It was pretty nuts. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. The players are looking forward to this. Um, and so that'll be round three in the third quarter of the year. Well, I just have to say, I'm looking forward to seeing a game, any game played in which the Mamluks are one of the powers. Yes. The Mamluks, the, the Golden Horde. Horde. Yeah, this is this is an interesting period in European history because this is kind of after the worst ravages of the Black Death had already kind of gone through. Um, and you had some empires here that didn't really last, like the Polish-Lithuanian Empire, oh, yeah, exactly. um, which yeah. has unfortunately poor Poland has been shrunk and rebuilt so many times since then. Um, you had the fact that the Habsburgs were just kind of a blip on the radar at the time. Um, and so the Hungary was actually where uh, Sigismund ruled and he was Holy Roman Empire emperor. So it's the, it, and you had this unity of Scandinavia um, through the Kalmar union, which uh, hasn't really happened since in the same exact way. So it's a, uh, it's a wild setup and uh and uh, people right, really well, enjoyed this. This is the this is the variant that's gotten the most play testing prior to the the tournament. Well, speaking of wild setups, I'd like to go to the next one, the last one, the Saga this of the, the Nine. Final round, yeah. This is a nine player variant. It is actually the variant that piloted that set of rules we were talking that I was talking about earlier with the the heirs and being able to create new powers and things like that. This is a variant that I co designed with Chris Halewig um, back in the days when we were doing a lot more on the play diplomacy forums. Um, and I wanted to create a fantasy setting, but still kind of ground it in at least some semblance of reality. So this is actually based on a real map, but it was a real incorrect map um, drawn by Mercator, the famous Mercator of the Mercator um, projection of the world. And at the time he was trying to figure out what the North Pole looked like. And so this is actually a polar map looking straight down at the North Pole and it's speculative geography based on what they knew about the coastlines of Greenland and Iceland. And you can even, if you look kind of where the, the light blue kind of teal portion is, that's Scandinavia right there. Right, um, right. I see that. There was a whole lot that they just didn't know. And so there's a lot of guesswork in here. Um, there's that whole continent in the middle there that, you know, we know is just ice. <laughs> um, so... I used that and flavored it with a lot of kind of Norse mythology and naming, um, as well as some naming of indigenous groups uh, from like, for instance, uh, groups from the northern reaches of North America, as well as some Slavic groups from northern Russia and such like that. Um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and it's been a little while since we played this one. But the fact that it has the same rules as Order of the Dragon means anybody who's already done round three, we'll know how to play this. Um, and the the positions uh, should be, it's a, it's a smaller, tighter map, so we should have some good contention for that final uh, tournament 
grand champion. Also seems like there's some natural tension between what I'm calling the polar powers and the ones that are not the polar powers. There's some natural yeah. tension. There. Yeah, and there's some also some oddness. So this is a very, very fleet heavy map. Like there's canals everywhere. Um, but there's a few choice spots that are either they're landlocked. There's only a handful of those, but there's also some connections uh that even though the two regions are not landlocked, the connection is only passable by armies. And so it's going to be, whereas in the Africa map, we had hardly any fleets and lots of armies on the mainland. Here it's going to be mostly fleets, but a few choice armies here and there are going to make a difference from time to time. All right. Well, speaking of the Africa map, I think we want to move on to talking about the game, or the first round game, right? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Is it? Yes. So, all right. So this is game 24A, um, the 24 for 2024 uh, tournament. So that's that's the naming convention. So on table A, uh, we ended up with uh, at the very end a very our Mozambique player uh, Ryan Rutledge, who goes by Waka, um, came very close to a solo. He ended up with 15 SCs, but about half an hour before the deadline. Um, he was going to get 17 and the victory condition is 18 in this map. Um, and so he was coming one away and then a half hour before some people changed their orders and then it came back down to 15, but he, he kind of blitzed the map <laughs> toward the very end. Um, he topped the board with 15 and then tied for second uh, were the modests in that kind of peach color and right. Yiki in red, um, who were David Gold and Kella Brimbor, respectively. Um, they they all did quite well. It was kind of interesting to see how this all uh, was going to play out by the end. Um, and I GM'd this particular map. Uh, the the way the tournament works is with because there's three tables, and I generally have problems doing more than two games at once. Uh, I always have somebody else GMing one of the rounds, so. Um, actually, I, I got that wrong. They didn't tie for second. They tied for third. Second place actually was a uh, train enthusiast who his name is, I think it's Lithuanian. It's uh, Jilvinas Jilinskas. Um, he's in green as the Sokoto Caliphate. Uh, uh -huh. So okay. there's a kind of the running theme for this particular set of games was that Sokoto always did pretty well. They didn't necessarily top, but they always did pretty well. Um, while poor Cape Colony got demolished, which is opposite of how the original playtest worked on this. Um, oh, so, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the I guess we can move to the next one. Okay. Let's go to the next uh, the next board. So this was game B. Um, this was GM'd by Jeff Pierce, um, who's made an appearance at DixieCon. Yes. Uh, the, the board topper was Brandon Custer, who goes by either Small Song or Bilbert online. He was Zanzibar. So you can see that nice big stretch of light blue there all along the East Coast. Um, coming in second was Sokoto Caliphate, played by Jonathan Strange, and yes, that's his real name. Um, mm -hmm. Also, <laughs> also um, has played it. Also has played at Dixiecon. Yes, also came to Dixiecon. Um, uh, here in this map, uh, we had a decent showing by Ethiopia. Um, this has been a position that's kind of struggled a little bit with this map, but uh, but Ethiopia did actually pretty well here. That's the light green. Um, as played by, oh, I want to make sure I get this right. Oh, uh, Reagan Bingham. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with how the game turned out. This also, this game had in it, uh, Cameron Higby in purple, mm -hmm. um, as, uh, Angola. And let's see, in position for Mozambique was King of Prussia or Tyler Harris. So, um, good range of players. This one, it, it's uh, having Cameron Higby in, involved, uh, somebody that I met at D DixieCon. I'm, I'm really pleased with how many face-to-face -face players I've been able to get involved in the tournament overall. Um, we've got next round, we've got Alex Maslow has uh, volunteered to jump in, and we got some others as well. So, yeah. Well, and Cameron is, Cameron is somebody that DBN viewers will recognize because he has played in the DBN Invitational. All right, so how about the last? you want to go to the last? Or yes, the next we'll board? go to game C. All right, so here the Yiki in red were played by Skitter 30, and what's really significant about Skitter is that she 
only just started playing Diplomacy about a year ago. Um, I invited her. She's somebody that I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons with online. And I invited her to come try it out. Um, and she took to it quite well and has just had a great pattern of success. It, you know, not always winning, but doing really well um, for the games that we were playing, especially these advanced variants. And so she ended up topping here and doing great. Um, and then there was a tie for second between Eric Ealing, who played Mozambique in white, um, and Alvin Hallander, or Flair, um, who played Sakota Caliphate in green. Um, we had... Let's see, a number of other players on this map. Uh, Emmett Rain Wainwright uh, was on this map, um, but unfortunately got knocked out pretty early. Um, mm -hmm. We had, uh, let's see. Now, for the for those scoring at home, Emmett is one of the folks who helps to run the face-to-face -face tournament in Denver. He used to be a North Carolinian, but now lives in Denver, Colorado, or near Denver. Um, we had Henry Flairman in purple in Angola. Um as well as uh, a few regulars in the kind of online circuit, Brown 496 as Ethiopia, Hen Shahensha as uh, the Ashanti in black. Um, mm. And so, and, uh, and then Adam Bagley, who's been a regular for my variants for years now, um, playing the modests in Peach. You know, it certainly looks like the Sakota, I'm just going in here a little bit, that the Sakota Calivate is doing well on all of these boards. What's the reason? Yes. Um, and so, you know, with variants, the tricky thing is like balance is, is hard to predict um, without a whole lot of play testing. And so here, the the consensus from the consensus from the players is that so if we if we were to look back at the original map, there's this kind of triangle of death between the Ashanti, the Tukalur in yellow, and the Sokoto in green, and whoever comes out of that triangle has a lot of potential success. So in the play test, Sakoto got wiped out eventually, and it was the Tukalur that that swept from that side. Um, in these games, this actually, this third game is an interesting story because the Sakoto were just about eliminated. They were down to a couple dots. One of their home centers had been taken over, and the player quit. Um, so Alvin Hallander came in and as a replacement and managed to negotiate his way back from two to now tying for second place. So oh. in, in a very short stretch of time. So um, this, this was not a map where Sakoto was kind of bound to succeed. This was a map where tooth and nail, he made it work. Uh, well, that's, that's not really the strength of the power. That's the strength of the player then. That, yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and of course there's, there's all sorts of things that go into the balance here. I really think in general, we had a good mix of players. A lot of people who were a little newer, um, and a lot of really strong players. Um, it helped that a lot of the people had been playing on my server for a, num a number of years and were really familiar with the, the systems. But even a lot of the newer players caught on pretty quickly. Um, so it was great. Well, it certainly looks like it's been a lot of fun. Now tell us a little bit time-wise how the tournament proceeds from here. Right. So that first round just finished. Um, and I've been talking about sort of board tops and ranks. This, the scoring for the tournament is based on Carnage. Um, with a slightly different kind of mathematical pattern to it. And so those ranks matter, and we will be kind of keeping the top two scores from the three rounds for every player. So some people, if they need to take a buy, or I mean, if I need to kind of make the numbers work for the table and have somebody take a buy, as long as everybody's got at least two, we're, we're at least kind of in a decent spot. Um, so from April to mid-June, we're going to be playing Succession and Legacy, and we'll have three tables again with Kella Brimbor helping me GM. He's the one who tied for third in that first game. Um, and then the third round, Ryan Rutledge will take on a, a GM role for one of the games, and that will be from uh, July 1st to sort of mid-September. With the very final round, we'll do, the, we'll do a kind of Paris method draft for the positions in the final round at the very end of September, and that should run... Uh, let's see, let's see, so, so October, to, yeah, that'll run till mid-December, so. Um, That's great. Well, we, we'll be checking in on the progress here on Deadline and getting you to report on how things are going yeah. as the year progresses. And I've, and I've purchased the grand prize, which is a, a very classy uh, custom mechanical keyboard. Um, ah. so, yeah. Okay. With, uh, well, I, I am sure that once this is over, you still have other plans for variants in the future. Yes. I know you. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. 
oh, I should have shared you the map with this, but um, there's a there's a global variant that I made last year that we did a very kind of kick the tires kind of play test. It was only four years. We we didn't really plan to play a whole game, but it's it takes the the DP rule set and pushes it to a global level. And so it is called Intercontinental. It has 180 SCs on it, um, but it's built for eight players. And so similar to 1812 Overture, the game that I played at DixieCon and had some people play, you control multiple powers. Mm. So, And those power combinations can be different uh, depending on the game. There's some of them that are kind of randomly assigned. Um, so instead of playing like a given power, you're kind of playing a color family, and then the powers are labeled accordingly. Um, but we had a lot of good time. We had a lot of fun with it um, in its sort of first half play test last year. And I'm looking forward to bringing it out for a full game next year. Um, there is a, a, a zine called God Save the Zine that still operates as an old fashioned zine. They just started at Hoplite Wars game, which has the same scenario where you've got a, basically a color family. You've got a main power, then you've got a colony, and then you've got mm. there's some other terminology for like minor ally or something. They're all scattered around oh, cool. around the Mediterranean, but the same code sounds like a similar. similar yeah, concept. I think I, I, what worked really well with doing the kind of multi-power setup is that it helps deal with the sort of imbalances that existed in, in a given point in history. So like for this given map, um, the British Empire was huge. And so by dividing the British Empire into effectively four different powers, even though they're all going to be played by the same player, that means that I can have then four different powers for somebody else that are split yes. in a different way. Um, so yeah, it uh, it lets you keep everybody roughly on the same level um, while still being able to reflect the the differences in, in scale and historical borders and things like that. Yeah, there was an old board game back in the day called Pax Britannica that was actually invented by a diplomacy guy named Greg Kostikian. Hmm. And and trying to figure out how to have a player play the British and a player play the Japanese, you know, for a 19th century game was hard. I mean, they both needed to be done, but it was such a different thing. I'm glad you've come up with a solution to that in terms of the Yeah, diplomacy. and I do think it works really well because here the Japanese aren't stuck on their own. Like it's, it's eight players total, so one of I think like four or five different players could get the Japanese and it might be attached to the same player who's playing the United States. It okay. might be attached to the player who's playing Portugal. Um, it really just depends. Um, so it, it's kind of divided out so that everybody gets, there's four continental theaters. There's the Americas, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And everybody gets one power in each of those theaters. Hmm. And some of them are tied together and some of them are not. So it's it's really, I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, especially once we get a full game of it going. It's it's definitely the sort of game that can take a while. Uh, so. All right. Well, let's let's do a sales pitch here. There's going to be people watching this episode who have never tried variants, never thought about variants, don't really understand why they should care about a variant. Now, for you and me, part of the fun for variants is literally the history of it. Yes. Just literally the history is part of the fun. But tell us otherwise. In terms of gameplay or people that are diplomacy fans, why should they try variants? So one of the big biggest things I hear from people who like variants, um, some of them just like different settings. They like whether it's a fantasy setting or they like kind of exploring the history. Um, they like the creativity like I do. Um, that's a big sell. But another thing that really people seem to tap into is the notion of an undefined meta. When you're talking about classic diplomacy, that has been played for so many years that there's a lot of deep knowledge that goes back for decades now of people knowing things that kind of work and things that kind of don't work um, when you're playing the game. There are openings that are pretty, like 99% of the time, that opening is an error. And that doesn't always exist with variants. Some, some variants have been around long enough that they've developed a sort of meta, but a lot of players like to take the tool set that comes from diplomacy, the negotiating, the tactics and things like that, and put it into an environment and a setting where the meta is something that they're kind of all coming up with at once, where the stalemate lines might exist, but they're not something that you can look up on the internet. Um, and so that exploratory function 
uh, can be a lot of fun. And there's a lot of people who enjoy that even more than classic because they feel like they're missing out on the meta. They feel like, like they're, there's two steps behind everybody else who knows this particular game really well. And that's why some people really love classic diplomacies because they've got that meta sort of memorized and they have that understanding of it so well. And that what, what makes for really good high level play is having people that are all on that same uh, level. But uh, I was, you know, with this tournament, I wanted to bring a level of high level play something that really felt like it mattered, something that people had investment in and, and weren't just kind of like clicking and then disappearing, which is sometimes the problem for automated interfaces. Um, I wanted to bring that level of play to a set of maps that some people had seen before, but most people had not. And and they seem to be really enjoying it so far. And I think variants in general can provide that where you just, you want to explore and use the same skill set that you've learned in diplomacy playing the classic version, but use it in a new scenario with without the kind of predetermined notions that you already have about the game. You know, all of that I completely endorse. And then another sort of practical reason I like to throw out to people when they're trying to, to develop a club scenario or a group of players that play together a lot, you cannot always get seven. There's a group that's meeting in North Carolina right now in Burlington most you know almost every month. And when they don't have seven, which they didn't, for their March game, they pulled out a five-player variant and played it. And then that is, and they do that in Denver too. They they play, they've got that, they've got a, a wooden version of hundred. Oh, they've nice. got, yeah. And they they when they've got 10 yeah. people or something, they put seven on one and three on the other. And they, yeah, and everybody yeah. plays. It's just a great that, way to develop a club camaraderie is to have that flexibility. Right. Absolutely. Um, there are variants of <laughs> lots of sizes. <laughs> can, yes. Yes. Well, know. we played, you know, we played ancient med at uh, Dick's economy right. this past right. year. That, yeah. That's a good, a good five player variant is a really handy thing to have. Exactly. Right. And, you know, cause you can do diplomacy classic with seven, obviously, and you can do this kind of six player variant works relatively well with diplomacy. But as soon as you start going below that on the classic map, it gets messed up. Yeah. And, it's not good. and so, with these variants, it's also kind of nice to have 10 people and the rules allow for a lot of interaction across the board so that even though you've got 10 people and you might be distant from each other on the map, the way the rules are is such that you can actually have some benefit from negotiating from people on the opposite side of the map, getting them to contribute secret bids toward the neutrals that are near you. Um, and so that's that's worked out really well. And that that's a you know that's <laughs> means you've got these bigger games uh, that you have to do more recruitment. I've seen variants that go up to thirty two on uh, V diplomacy, but <laughs> that that just seems like hurting cats to me. Um, uh, <laughs> having having participated one time in a face to face chaos game with thirty four players, Ooh. chaos was not even the right word for the. <laughs> But anyway, give us your final thoughts, Alex, for the audience. I think this has been great for both variant and non-variant people alike. Okay, give us some final thoughts. Yeah, variants are fun. Um, variants allow for a lot of creativity. I love doing this. I love GMing and making new maps. Um, I love playing diplomacy. I'm, I'm not quite as good at it as I, as I am at managing games. Um, but I just encourage people to try it out. I also encourage people to just come check out the game. I've got a whole Discord server with... Um, lots of history of older games that you can go back and see the maps and see a lot of the public discussion on. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I encourage anyone who's interested to come take a look. Um, if you want to run one of my maps on your own with a group of people, just let me know and I can get you the resources for that. Well, get, send me your, a link to your discord server so that yes, I can I'll add that to the show to notes and server and my website that has um, most of my variants kind of posted um, in a nice form. And if they've got those links, they can contact you directly through those yes. media. Yes, okay. they should be able to, to get in contact with me, yes. All right, Alex, thank you so much again for being on the show, and good luck with the tournament through time. Thank you very much. And now it's time for a segment of our show we call The Winner's Circle, in which we interview diplomacy hobby winners to find out what happened, why it happened, and just how it feels to reach the top of the diplomacy heap. Let's talk now to Australian Peter McNamara, fresh off his win just a few weeks ago in the latest edition of the Diplomacy Broadcast Network Invitational Virtual Tournament. Peter, welcome to the show. For those who might not know your diplomacy origin story, could you share that, please? 
Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I first played diplomacy back with uh, friends many years ago now when I was a high school student. Uh, later on, when I was a university student, I discovered the judges online, played a couple of games there. And then a few years later, I was playing online again, and Thorin Munro, who was the GM of the game, um, some people might recognize his name. He, I was playing on the DP judge. He noticed I had a University of Sydney email address. He also lived in Sydney, and he invited me along to the 2005 New South Wales Championships held in Sydney. And I guess the rest of that is history. I've been playing um, face-to-face events ever since. So you've been around the hobby for many years now, based on that. How would you compare the hobby of you know 2005 or whatever it was to the hobby of now? Saying I've been around for so long makes me sound old. No, not, not coming from me, it doesn't. So, Yeah, um, I think back when I started, the face-to-face hobby was a bit bigger than it is now, which is a bit sad. Um, but we have seen some good signs of growth in the last couple of years, which makes me very optimistic for the, the future. Online, um, I'm less involved with online hobbies outside of the virtual face-to-face play, so I can't quite tell as much. But I've never really known the sizes. Back when, it, but it's very different because back when I started playing, we mostly played seventy-two hour turns, and some of us were still um, playing on dial-up, which certainly meant there was no virtual FTF play. Yes, virtual is obviously a very new format. So let's talk about formats for a minute. Is face-to-face still your jam? Is it still what you really like, or you know, to compare that a little bit to the other forms that you've played recently? Uh, yeah, I, for me, face-to-face is the um, my favorite way of playing. Um, I much prefer playing in real time where you're really immersed and entirely dedicated to the game for however many hours the game takes and then it's done. You put your feet up and um, relax. Um, I think it's very different from the pace of press games where I find they can consume your entire spare time if you uh, allow them to. And so... I prefer face-to-face and virtual over press, and I prefer face-to-face over virtual because of the social aspect. Um, When you're playing with people in person, you then get the opportunity to hang out with some really awesome people afterwards. Well, that's true. And you just just mentioned to me that you're going to be at Whipping this year, right? Yes, I am. Um, A few people already know this. So by the time people see this interview, frankly, it'll probably be Whipping Weekend by the time they see this interview. So that'll be awesome for, for folks to realize that you are right there uh, playing in a North American event at the same time they're watching this interview. All right, let's dive right into your victory in this year's DBNI. First of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, tell us a little bit about your 2023 season results that got you into the DBNI, and then tell us a little bit about the preliminary rounds. Uh, I went to Bangkok and got a fourth place at Worlds, and that wasn't quite enough to qualify. Actually, at the start of November, I only had a few VDL points on top of that, so I wasn't um, sure I was even going to qualify for this um, DBNI because I wasn't expecting to play in the VDC at the time. But then um, in November, I rocked up to my last VDL game of the season as a standby, and I got enough points to play in the top board. And then uh, the VDC got moved to January, and I did well there. So I got both qualification and a high seed. And then for the preliminary rounds, um, as exposited beautifully on the DVN channel, um, you got to see a 1905 elimination as Austria for me in the first chance round. So that didn't start very well. But the last chance round, I picked France, found an ally in Craig Mayer, and conflicts elsewhere on the board meant that was enough for me to secure a win and make it through to the top board. You know, I really appreciated your explanation of your season at the end there, not thinking you were even going to qualify, and then, you know, getting into the top board of the VDL and then the VDC. That just goes to show you that it's never too late to start working on DBNI qualification, right? No, it never is. And it's also um, never too early either. Also true. Yeah, it would have been better if you'd already uh, had some good results earlier in the year. You wouldn't have to worry so much at the end of the year. But I I get your point. Uh, All right, well, let's talk about the top board because that was quite a thrilling end on the Super 7 top board this year. What made the difference for you during those last few turns, you think? Oh, it's hard to know ultimately what the difference was because I haven't gone back and analyzed it, but I did see afterwards the um 
the sideline reporters are telling me that England, France, and Germany were just not really getting on with each other at that point, which really helped. But also, maybe I just got lucky. Um, I managed to get my timing right with my move on Seren, as it happened to be a turn where everyone in the West just moved everything away from me, which is beautiful. Like there was a German army in Silesia that could have caused problems, but it walked back to Munich. Um, I was counting on them all, thinking that they needed me to control Seren, and I was able to use that um, that freedom they gave me to grab the victory for myself. Yeah, I know you. You if, watching the DBN broadcast, you know that I thought a critical issue in your favor was Seren's build there at the end. Not building in Khan meant now, and then and then not even if she built in Smyrna, she she could have convoyed it to Greece. In other words, there was a way for her to protect Romania, but she just didn't do it. Um, I, we actually didn't talk about that build, but I, I can understand what, um, what Saren was doing. I think she needed to have me scared of the West and think that we still needed to grow. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm not being critical of Saren. It's, there were considerations going both directions, but the choice that she made and then the choice you made, as you said, timing wise really worked out for you and not for her. Yeah, it worked out beautifully for me. Um, and when I made the move, I didn't know if it was going to work out or not. It was sort of um, really up in the air because it depended on how everyone else reacted. Well, give us a sense of what it felt like when you realized you had edged the others out for the title based on the tiebreaker. Well, I hadn't. Ed I didn't realize that until I didn't. I wasn't sure of it until, of course, the draw actually passed. Before that that happened, I knew that I was in a good position, but I still might have a lot of work needed to do in the last couple of years to hold on. But then the draw passed, and then you get, um, I guess, these emotions of uh, joy and relief. Although um, I'm not sure a Texas Instruments calculator can uh, feel emotions. Yes, uh, obviously there might have been some hyperbole involved in calling you a Texas Instruments calculator. But anyway, I was also thinking it was important to talk about the fact that in this game, you were down to either three or four centers. Was it three or four that you were down to? I mean, that was quite a comeback, I think. Um, yeah, um, well, I, I don't even think my comeback was the most impressive in the game. If you looked at uh, Saren's position at the end of 2 that's true. That that's was true. much, much worse. That's um, true. But of course, she didn't win the thing. You came no, back but, to win the thing. But, but we both made comebacks to positions where we could have won if things had gone our way and there were there was play. Yeah, g g give those out there, the people watching this interview, some hope that they can do the same thing. They're down to you know, sort of a difficult position, two or three centers, you know, in, in an Eastern power, you're surrounded as Austria, and yet you were able to still come back. Give people hope that they can do what you did. I think diplomacy is a great game in that the come, comeback is always there. Um, usually if there's no comeback available, you're sort of going to get eliminated within a year or two. Um, you just have to hold on, fight hard, work hard, talk to everyone, and then just wait for this opportunity to present itself. And so on the top board, I was able to hold on tactically, um, barely hold on tactically against Matt's Russia. He was um, eventually getting the better of me until that juggernaut fell apart and um, turning into an Austrian-Turkish alliance. Yeah, that was obviously very critical. Well, you also won this event after the 2020 season, so we have to talk about that for a minute and for allow you to compare and contrast the two experiences, if you would. I, it was, it, I guess um, there's a few differences because in 2020, 2021, we were still sort of finding our feet running this virtual hobby. Um, but even then, it was sort of clear that as long as the, uh, the DBNI managed to continue, it would be considered one of the most important titles on the circuit. So that, that prestige was already there. Um, now it's, it's an established event. So I feel like it attracts players more and there are more people thinking about, oh, I really want to play in this. I really want to play against good players. And I really want to win this. So there's more desire amongst the community to um, play in and win this title now than I think there was at, at the start, but it was always there at the start. Oh, I think so. I think it was a, an exciting thing to, to, for, to begin during COVID. And I think people really got into it even in its first season. Yeah, I agree. Well, the games themselves were somewhat different, as I recall. You were playing Italy in the game f back in four years ago, or three years ago, weren't you? Um, 
Yeah, the games were also different because they were um, untimed back then. And so uh, actually, I think one of the uh, organizers told me that they were, as we got into like 1917 or something in that first DB&I top board, they were sort of starting to worry about what was going to happen if we never actually voted for a draw. Yeah, well, we were all, as you said, we were all feeling our way through this virtual hobby thing, which I think we've eventually figured out pretty well. But in, in the early days, it was a little bit of a wild west. Uh, how important do you think this DBNI, this invitational, is to the hobby? Uh, I think it's very important. Um, it provides a really great focal point as a, a season-ending event to the hobby. So it gives us a, a sort of a, a season, which is what you see in many um, sports leagues. And also not just the hobby, but also the the DBN's promotion of the game in particular. Well, you, you know, you um, you also have the distinction of being the only person, I think, who has made three of the four top boards. So you have some perspective here. Tell us how the event has changed. You mentioned the, the time limit thing has changed. But tell us how you think the event itself has changed, either in terms of competition or strategy or format or whatever. We have seen some format changes because, um, of course, the first – the first years had longer games, or at least some of them were untimed, and now they're all timed at 1915 or 1916, um, which is still a very long game to play. But also the, the format has changed from a sort of more of a traditional model of you have you, you have a scoring system and you get points to now it's just you have to top your board in your semi-final round, which I think is definitely um, for the better. Um, it it makes the game different. Like every board is now a top board. You don't have this sort of. You know, often you have these when you play diplomacy. You have people can have uh, motives that are like I want a strong result, but they're not necessarily going to top the board, and you can work with that. Whereas on a on a pure top board situation, you have to sort of realize that there's only one outcome and and play accordingly. It's a, it's a winner take all in every round, basically. Yeah. It, it is a different form. I think people are finding that exciting. I think so too. Yeah. Well, you're the only two time winner of the Calhammer Cup. So, any words of wisdom to impart to the hobby about that from your exalted perch? That you oh, have? I don't know. It's it's an honor to be the only um, two time winner of the Calhammer Cup. I think I was interviewed last year before the top board, and I said I needed to win to break the tie with Jason Massbaum. Mm. for most Calhammer Cups, and now I've finally done that, but I'm just one year late. Yeah, I think everyone is appreciative of the fact that you are no longer tied with Jason in any in any way. I think that is good for the hobby, if that's what you're arguing. Uh, well, I'm no longer tied with Brandon now as well. No, you could not be more right about everything you've just said, frankly. All right, well, you mentioned something earlier about the fact that you first went to a tournament in Sydney. It was a New South Wales champ. I think you said it was the New South Wales championship, yeah. right? Which, you know, just goes to show you that back in the day, Australia did have a circuit of tournaments. And I remember this, uh, you know, from afar, hearing about the you had a Bismarck Cup, you know, that gave cup points and all that. So I know that you just had a tournament in Melbourne, right? Yes. Yeah, so just a few days before this conversation, we had a the Melbourne Diplomacy Open. Um, it was a very successful event. I'm very happy. Uh, we had many players showing up for their first face-to-face -face tournament. That's awesome. So um, it was run by Andrew Goff, held in the center of Melbourne. We had um, three, ra three rounds, three boards for each of the first two rounds. And then everyone was so happy that they came back and we got four boards for the final round on the Sunday. So that made it the largest tournament we've had in Australia since 2011. I went and looked that up. Oh, that is, that is very exciting. All right, now give us the news on who won, which, of course, will will not surprise there very many people. Um, so there haven't been many different winners of tournaments in Australia in the last um, last few years, so you can probably guess uh, this one is Jamal Blackaway. Right. And, of course, I think Jamal is running an event coming up at the end of April, isn't he, in Canberra? He's uh, running it. Yes, the Hum Parliament Handicap is what it's named, and he's running it, so someone else will have a chance to win it. It's going to be four rounds of diplomacy, and it's April 12 to 14 are the actual dates. Uh, hopefully, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see some uh, information at the bottom of this video. And yep, 
there will I'm be there will be a link down there. There will be a link down there for sure. But that's pretty exciting, though. I mean, another another new tournament in Australia. That's got to be that's got to be cool from your perspective, of course. Yeah, it's great. And then um, hopefully we'll even get one in Brisbane and maybe a second one in Melbourne later this year. Oh, that would be awesome. You also have the Snake Pit. That's the virtual league having started up that has Australia-friendly time zone games. So how exciting is it to be a member of the Australian hobby right now? Um, it, it's good because uh, for the first time in a while, we've got viable hobbies in a few different places, both Melbourne and Canberra, and hopefully up in Brisbane with um, Gavin and Ken, which is putting us in the healthy, healthiest place we've been in over a decade. I know, you, as you mentioned, like the there used to be the Bismarck Cup, which hasn't been awarded for quite a while because we haven't had enough events. So hopefully the Bismarck Cup will be back this year. And I'm looking forward to seeing the new generation of players come through. We've got some uh, very cool and exciting people coming through. That's very, very, very neat to have first-time con-goers. Con uh, it's always a great time. Well, I didn't prepare you for this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I think people will want to know. All right? What explains your overall continued success in this hobby? Tell me. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I didn't prepare you for it. No. But, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, and I'm not trying to build you up or anything, but anybody who's paid attention in diplomacy knows that you have been successful for a long extended period of time. And I think people who are out there learning the game would love to be able to say they have won a tournament or frankly even done well at a tournament or in a virtual event or whatever. And you've been able to, you know, string some successes together. Do you think there's a particular strength of your game uh, that you would, you know, throw out there for people to get better at maybe? Um, I, I think there's, well, there's two sides to the game really. There's one is the, the tactics and the strategy. I think I see tactics and strategy reasonably well. Um, not perfectly, I'm missing things, but everyone misses things. Um, but if you give me a short period of time, I can come up with a reasonable set of moves most of the time. Um, and then diplomatically, just remain calm, talk to everyone, be their friend. Even if they're trying to attack you, they, you can turn them. They will turn. Yeah, I think if, one thing that I think you're good at is not overreacting to other people doing things. Yeah. because that completely constrains your choices. And we all, even TI calculators, have emotions, and it can be hard to not overreact, right? Yeah, it can be It can be hard to keep um, emotions in check sometimes. And I, I might have gotten better at this as I get older. Well, I think that's true for most of us that have played. You know, the, that's one thing that you can – that you can get better at with age is the ability to uh, keep your, to frankly, keep your options open and not be constrained by your own choices. Yeah. Any final thoughts for our audience? Uh, just thank you for having me. And I look forward to uh, stabbing and being stabbed by all of you soon. Well, I'm sure that everyone very much looks forward to playing with you in every game in which they say your name on the player list. Peter, thank you so much for being here on deadline. And again, Congratulations on what was really a thrilling and outstanding result. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks to all of you watching at home. We hope you have enjoyed this broadcast of Deadline. If you have news, ideas for features, or feedback of any kind, please feel free to send an email to info at diplobn.com, or you can drop me a line directly using davidhood at dixiecon.com. To review all of our broadcast offerings, visit our website, www.diplobn.com. This is David Hood signing off. I wish you brightness and bliss and, of course, Belgium. <laughs>